And the other thing with Finley Christie, is he, what, best Scottish nine in the world at the moment? Um, there's been a few questions. I know he went to New Zealand when he was seven, but there's been a few questions. Right, hello, and in the week that London Irish finally announced some signings as Homer comes home, plus Simmons becomes the latest Irish Wallaby, and Ben Smith and Aaron Cruden signed for the Kobe Steelers. And this is the Ruck and Wall podcast. Uh, good evening, Joe and Johnny. They join me this week. How are you guys getting on? Good evening. Yeah, not too bad. Enjoying the sun. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, we are obviously down in Bristol yesterday. A few ciders in hand. It was a lovely, lovely time. No Harry Berryman this week. He's off in uh, his chateau in, in, uh, in France. Over His hotel overlooked <laughs> the Royan Stadium. So... He's, doing, he's still had his bits of rugby, but unfortunately can't join us. But yeah, so on this episode, we're going to look at the misery of the Chiefs and Caleb Clark is becoming the next big thing. Over in Super Rugby AU, it went to Super Time, baby. Uh, and Hansen breaks the Reds' hearts. Uh, we're, we're going to also look for our Players of the Week and discuss the centre partnership in our Lions 15. And maybe is it time for us to get some Irish and some Scottish players in the team? Because currently it's... Just English and Welsh at the moment. Anyway, right, let's start with the rugby of the weekend. And first game up in Super Rugby R Tier Roa was the Chiefs versus the Crusaders. Uh, the Crusaders taking it in the end 32 19. But I just wanted to start really with the main sort of discussion point, which really kind of riled the commentators. It riled up some Chiefs fans. And that was uh, in the second half. Uh, the Chiefs are right back in the game at 17 16 at the time. Uh, Jordan makes a break. He offloads it to Quinton Strange, who's come off the bench. Um, and it looks in real time like the ball has gone backwards, and there, but there's some Chiefs players think it's a knock on. Um, and their commentators are very much anti the referee's decision that the, the, they took a long time to deliberate over it. And for me, the more you see of it, it looks to go backwards. What's your, what's your thoughts, lads, as a key moment of the game? I think if you look at it less with the law, um, Severi Reese is kind of not Severi Reese, Jordan's bumbling it forward. Um, but the final movement is backwards. The final movement from his, from his hand pushing it backwards. And the rules state, I don't know, is it, it has to touch a, another player or, or the ground going forward. Didn't touch another player, didn't touch the ground. And it was travelling backwards. Um, so it wasn't a knock-on. It wasn't a knock-on. But And I think it, like, again, everyone's like, oh, the Chiefs got let down by the referee. But they still lost, what was the final score, 32-19. Like, they weren't in it at the end. If that was a final minute decision, it's easy to pick away at, like, refs' decisions. But I don't know. Yeah, they're kind of... It's, it's easy to complain about refs refs decisions but that's not the problem the problem is they, they haven't won a game yeah exactly they they that isn't a good enough excuse to not win a game um and to still lose it by that margin i agree with you let the law that's backwards it um it left his hands backwards he pretty much hit it backwards after he lost control of it but that's still going backwards and it's just typical for i think of those commentators that they 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 get on the back of anything that's against the kind of the flow of the game and that doesn't look pretty, but not all of rugby looks pretty. Like it's the rules are there to be used. So you got, you got to use them as they're laid down in the law. It's a good try. Good little pickup from Reese. Yes. Um, and yeah, it does take it away from the, the Highland, the, the chiefs a little bit, took the game away from them, but exactly the same thing has happened as happens every week with the Crusaders, unless you've got a big enough margin like the hurricanes had, the Crusaders are going to come back and it's going to score at least two tries in the last uh, 20 minutes. So you've got to be far enough away from them before that happens. Um, I don't think the Chiefs would have got... I didn't expect the, the Chiefs to get anywhere near the Crusaders. So to get as close as they did was kind of credit to them in a way. And this isn't the... There wasn't a game to be trying to win your first win of the tournament, even though they've obviously got to get as any points they can because they're very much struggling. But... Yeah, I guess, again, from the Chiefs, a few little good touches, but still can't get the W. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting thing. They're just, like, they're just kind of not blaming blaming things. Kind of Gatlin, it was interesting, Gatlin's um, 
post-match interview and the bloke to me i'm not even uh, again you're entitled to everyone's entitled to their opinion so i'll just say mine the man the man looks broken he looks absolutely broken um after the game he was just like he just kind of went yeah that's kind of rugby he wasn't really and it, other people are like saying it is i mean it's clearly backwards again like we the commentators they did the same thing in the blues game when aaron smith where carl T- uh, tufanaki trips up aaron smith the bloke's offside it's a, there's a clear ruck he's offside and they were like oh they it's ridiculous he's aaron smith milked it yeah he might have milked it but he's still lying in the way like these are still infringements that that uh, that the referees have re- refereed well and generally the referee across super rugby rtro and super rugby au this weekend was really really good but again we, we you can't hide away from the fact that the chiefs were beaten and again were beaten quite comfortably like Crusaders scored two um, set piece work tries where the first one from Sanders, which is just shows from him moving to eight, unbelievable gas that they've gone back inside. That was a fantastic finish to rup- poor old Damian McKenzie got run over. Yeah. And then the Leicester Funganuku, who in his last outing against uh, the Highlanders, who thought maybe deserved the try, got one again where they've come back down the short side and um, the replacement hooker, I can't remember his name, has put it back into Richie, and who, Richie had another good game as well. But again, they were always that, again, that another step up. And though Bashir had a good game, again, took it over. Okay. So Cooler had a good game for the Chiefs. They just, yeah, they just haven't got the, the, that, that next bit to get them up to the, the level they need to do to take the win. And like looking at it, what, they only scored one try? And Crusaders scored five. Yeah. And like that's that's a big difference. And they they're just like I just can't they just don't seem to jowl as a team. They've got some great individuals, but at points it kinda looks like mm, we're just chucking the ball around here. And like it's I don't know, they're not then and I feel there's an awful lot of pressure on McKenzie and people like that to suddenly perform now. Um and Sam Kane still Put put a good shift in. I think he had something like eighteen tackles. Still doesn't look kind of there. I mean, it might get to a point that actually they know Cruden's off and people like that. They might as well give their young guns a go now because what's what's happening now is not working. Yeah, as I say, like uh, we we spoke about this. The Chiefs have probably got the th- overall the third best squad on paper in in the. Like player by player, they've probably got the third best squad. Crusaders have got the best squad by a mile. The Blues probably in second, then the Chiefs, then the Hurricanes, then the Highlanders. But then you look at the table and that doesn't that hasn't transformed. And yeah, occasionally they've it, they're they're all blacks, maybe haven't stood up. But as I say, they Damian McKenzie again, like puts in a good performance, but aimless kicking, the amount of times where he's kicked the ball away for no reason, it's not gone anywhere. Will Jordan's had so much time to pick it up and then boot it straight out and they've they've got field position they put the Chiefs under pressure um they were yeah as I say they were in the game again they probably had more of the possession the first half but again the Crusaders that the juggernaut they are just absorb the pressure and as you said they, they've got the power to score as I say five tries like again the Crusaders probably were in fourth gear they were better than they were they were better than they were against the Canes they cut out the mistakes their line out was a lot better I think a little, they had three line outs in a row where they changed the lit, they changed the jumper. So it was like Whitelock, then Havili took one, then Sanders took one, then Dunshay took one. So it was really difficult for them to read. I mean, they're much better. They put themselves in a really good position again to go on and win the, the whole tournament. But I don't know, sort of my thing is, I put to you, I know it's slightly controversial, but is Gatlin the right man for the Lions now? The thing is, like with the Lions, is that you can't go on a seven-game losing streak because you're not playing seven tests. If, if if it goes badly in one test, he's got to turn it around straight away. And there's a question, will that happen? Um, is he willing to mix it up that much or have kind of a... Like, it just it just seems like... I, I haven't noticed huge amounts that kind of the Chiefs improved in little areas, but they haven't kind of done an overhaul. And there might be a Lions test where you, it doesn't work in the first test. You know, let's do something completely different. And I couldn't see Gatlin doing that. Um, 
and it feels like it is a weird thing just to kind of confirm when did they confirm Gatlin is the Lions coach oh yeah eight ages ago and it I kind of it's yes it's great to have that consistency but do, do you need to have that consistency is it going to change like are they going to be thinking for I don't know a few years how to beat South Africa or could it be announced this summer they're not going to announce a squad to what next April um uh, I don't know just just having him saying oh we're just having Gatlin it's, it's, an, it's an interesting one yeah, it's it's one of those, isn't it, where it's it's, a, it's very different from any other um, scenario in, in when you're coaching rugby. Very very different to club rugby. Slightly different again to probably your normal international tours, um, but far more about bringing together a, a group of players um, quickly, which you do a lot in international uh, rugby, but not very much in clubs. So I think I think you can't really take too much of the club form over to whether he's going to be a good Lions coach or not, because it is such a different scenario. And the other thing with it as well is um, he's got just an unbelievable pool to pick from. So you're going to have a, a very, very good team. <clears throat> you're less likely to be at the moment. Yes, he's got some good players that he's probably not getting the best out of, but he's also carrying a lot of players. Um, he's not going to be carrying players on the Lions. True. They're going to have 15 of the best players in the world. So to a certain extent, they play the rugby for him. And they'll have big names in those squads, the likes of Farrell, you know, Wynne Jones. Some of those boys will know what they want to do and what rugby they want to play. They're going to have a certain element of uh, ownership and responsibility over it where you probably don't have as much of that uh, at the Chiefs. So I get what you're saying. A seven-game losing streak is is bad in anyone's book. But um, if anything, it's just one of those where... Gatlin's been away from club rugby, away from New Zealand rugby for a very long time now. Yeah. He's been in Wales. He's been doing the international circuit for a long time now. I think he's probably got a bit used to that scenario and he did that very, very well. And if anything, he's probably going to really looking forward to coming back to the Lions because it's something that's going to be more familiar to him. So if anything, I think he's going to be very much looking forward to, to getting there at the minute. I don't think he's enjoying yeah. it at the minute. I mean, he's, he's probably going to be back to a European like way of playing rugby. And the Lions might just be kind of, yes, as coaching, but actually there's not probably too much because you're going to have 15 blokes who are the best from four countries. And it's probably a lot of actual player management, which he clearly has a lot of respect. And the other thing, probably, I don't know, kind of, he's probably, his mind's probably already in the Lions. This was probably like a little stop, stop gap and the Chiefs needed a coach and they thought, oh, there's a, there's a there's a guy who's coached Wales for for ten years. Um, uh, let, let's have him. Yeah, and it, obviously he's, he's from there. That that's where sort of his coaching sort of career sort of maybe started. But they might. Have, I don't really know how the politics of it all works and how the contracts work in particular. But when you've got guys like Brody Metallic, who was meant to be in Japan, who's not there, he's currently not signed with the club. Could they have t- t- could they have taken him on a short term deal? Like the Hurricanes, obviously, have got Julian Sarvea, Sam Whitelock, who was meant to be in Japan at this time. He wasn't even meant to be playing Super Rugby Art Hero. And just on him, just brilliant from him. He had a great game on his 150th uh, appearance. So, uh, great shout to him. But, again, they're sat in the crowd. I don't know if the, you saw, but Liam Messam sat in the crowd. And you just think, I mean, he's signed for Waikato in, for the um, for the Mitre 10. So, that's great. He's coming back to New Zealand after having some time away in France and stuff. But again, you've got a guy of that quality sat in a stand. Could they have like done something there to get him back in the squad? I don't know. That doesn't, that doesn't get, they're not going to guarantee that anyway, but yeah, they've got one game left. As I say, they don't, they, their bye week is in round 10 to the last week. So they've, they've got one game next week against the Hur- Hurricanes to get something out of it. Otherwise it unfortunately hasn't been the greatest competition for them, but as I say, like people like Boshir, so uh, so cooler stood up really well in the in the back row again. But the Crusaders for me, just a straightforward bish bash bosh. They know what they needed to do much better, um, and they took the chance as well. And people that didn't play well last week, like Will Jordan, um, for example, he was much better. Uh, Pyer in the centre was really good as well. And then to bring on a guy like Lester Funganuku, who's got so much pace, got so much energy, is it's quite devastating. So. And I'm sure if Bear Moon was here, he'd be talking about that Cody 
Taylor try and that great rolling maul repeatedly. So we've got to, we've got to give that a little mention. Yeah, great bit it of ball is really play. well set. <laughs> At the moment, as I say, mauls, as I said, we've said this before, but having a key driver in maul is, is really, really key. And we'll, as I said, we'll talk about the Brumbies as they scored two tries off that again. So, um, yeah, we'll talk about that more in a moment. But yeah, moving on to Highlanders Blues game. Um, the first time ever that the Blues have won uh, in the Forsyth Bar Stadium since it was uh, sort of commissioned for the use of the Highlanders back in 2012. They took a 32-21 uh, victory. Uh, they scored, I think, four or five tries. Just looked really, really, really strong. Um, but I want to talk. I just want to talk about one person really, and that's Caleb Clark. Yeah, he was awesome, wasn't he? Very, very good. But he, him and Finney Christie had quite a, a fruitful partnership. Yeah. Didn't um, they're a very, very good team, the Blues. They all are in New Zealand, but the Blues seem to be particularly, at the moment, very, very good at that offloading game. And they've always got one or two options of runners that are running very good lines. And they're, they're always looking to get their hands free. And, it, and it, it creates tries all the time. It's so hard to defend against. The bit that I most enjoyed, which I keep thinking about it and keep thinking about how ridiculous it was is when he, he took that, I think it was a crossfield kick from Bowden Barrett and he was in the air. If you're somebody coming across to make that tackle, you're, you've got the touchline there. The winger is in the air. When you reach him, the only result that you're even thinking about that thing might happen is that you hit that bloke into touch because when you're in the air, you've got no control of the ground. You're not touching the ground. So you've got, you know, you've got no momentum. He managed to catch it, and as he landed, bosh, Ioani. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. How do you, from that position there, in the air, feet off the ground, then bosh the man that's less than a metre away from you and then go on to, to set up a try? Literally ridiculous piece of skill. And he's yeah. not, he's obviously a quite a robust guy, yeah. but he's not a massive winger. He's not a George North or an Adolo. I haven't seen those guys do this, let alone... You know, Caleb Clark so that piece of skill was absolutely ridiculous for me he for me is standing up as they talk they talked obviously talked about that about competition for places on the wing and stuff and the strength and depth they've got there but for me he's putting himself way above the parapet now and this the, the kid's 21 like you kind yeah. of forget that like but he's so powerful he's so quick he's I think maybe if you put him under maybe the pressure of international at the moment we don't know because the moan he the moan sort of competition he's come under is obviously the Crusaders. That's the real test. But yeah, he has got an amazing, amazing future ahead of him. It was really nice to listen to his the pre-match with his dad. Uh, they did like a Sky did a really, really good clip of them, and he just he just loved. It's really nice. He's got so much um, passion, and he's like he just looks up his dad, his dad so much. He wants to follow in his footsteps there. So yeah, really, really exciting. But again, for me, the Blues just. They they knew what they needed to do that this weekend, and that was go go out, beat the Highlanders, get a bonus point, and get back up the road um, for next week's game. But as I say, like Berryman, kind of he's not here, so he can't defend himself. But he made a quite the outrageous claim at the start of our podcast about Carl Sinclair being the best prop in the world. But I, f- uh, I fear Tunga Fassi at the moment is pushing that boy close. He destroyed Aidan Johnston today. <laughs> destroyed him him and Carl um, Tafuke they they I've never seen the uh, the blue scrum be that dominant it was cr- incredible like sum, summarizing the guy up that they took a they had a scrum obviously on the five meter line they've pushed the scrum over they've picked and gone around the corner he's he's managed to get off the floor and take the next pod around the corner and he scores off that that work rate is unbelievable so for me, he's well up there in, in that sort of echelon of um, being the, one of the best props in the world. But again, lovely tries from the Blues. As you said, um, Finley Christie's second try. Barrett's oh. ridiculous. Looks like he's going to do a crossfield kick. Nah, nah, don't worry, lads. I'm going to th- chuck a 35-metre pass. And then T- Samuel Lamborn runs away and Clark carries, gets the, gets the offload away and he scores. But yeah, just... A really nice, complete performance. Bowden's best performance of the Blues, in my opinion. And I think I think it showed for Bowden that actually, like, he's such a good player, and everyone's like, "Oh, he might not be the best fullback at, in at best position in his fullback." Um, but he's a wasted talent, I think, at fullback. He's so good at bringing people onto the ball and swinging passes, and his is actually his wider like that pass, the crossfield kick to Caleb Clark. It's his vision. 
Mm. Um, and he's got the skill set to do it. Um, and he, does, he 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 always looks like he's got time on the ball and he knows what he's going to do. It never looks kind of he's completely kind of just slinging passes about. It's it always looks kind of planned. Um, and the other thing with Finley Christie is he what best Scottish nine in the world at the moment? Um, there's been a few questions. I know he went to New Zealand when he was seven, but there's been a few questions. Kind of he's been. I don't know how many teams he's been in. I think this is his third Super Rugby team. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think like, he was Hurricanes. He was at the Hurricanes because you and I think he's still a Hurricanes on his uh, the Sky Scotsman. All eyes on Finley Christie ahead of rugby. Um, yeah, he's Scottish, 95, so he's the same age as us. Yeah, um, and he's and he's been to. Um, I think he's yeah. I think he started at the Chiefs and then went to the Canes and. Like he's he's got a reasonable amount of experience and he's quite highly rated. Um, but I thought he had a really good game, especially kind of going into that. You know, you're probably against the best nine in the world. Um, and he and he held his own. Um, uh, and he's not the he's not the biggest bloke. He's is he's not carrying many pounds, but he he certainly um has an impact. And he's he's not afraid to not afraid to take it to have a pick and go if it, if he's if he's close. Yeah, he's been, him and Kurt Eklund really have been the fine to the Blues in the last few weeks. So with the Blues, obviously Sam Knox started Super Rugby Artero so really so well. And obviously James Parsons had a great uh, start before he got his concussion, unfortunately. But yeah, Christy stepped in into that thing. Yeah, he's, as I said, he's been at Tasman. He was at the, he's been at the Chiefs, uh, Hurricanes and then the Blues. So hopefully now he's sort of settled there. And um, as I say, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, and you're looking at a nine in his prime at 25. Yeah. And if you want some Scotland caps, because he's not going to get any New Zealand caps. He's not as, I don't think he, he's probably well away from that All Blacks jersey. But as I said, that's not, that's not a diss on him. That just shows how competitive uh, the All Blacks nine jersey is. But certainly he could easily walk straight into that Scotland team, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Um, um, just a word on the Highlanders then. Um, I've kind of some. I don't. Please feel free to disagree with me, but they just. It, it seemed to me that they weren't really at the races today. They were quite slow at the blocks. The Blues kind of blew them away. Like they kept themselves in it because the Blues discipline. Uh, they got four penalties. Like Josh only kept them well in it. He is made. He's made a massive difference for them. Like we talked about, Mitch Hunt is a decent player in that role, but flipping Nora, he what he is seriously good. This kid. Um, and, and again, if you want to find someone that, if you want to get someone up in the Norman Hemisphere that maybe not made, makes it in the All Blacks team, he would be an amazing, amazing addition to anyone or around the world. So again, uh, Frizzell, nice well worked try for them. And then Josh, when, when Nareki comes off the bench, again, he's just so quick. And I really thought they might nick a losing bonus point or try and nick something at the end. But yeah. There's not a lot to say from the Highlanders. They weren't at the best, and you've got to be at your best to beat the Blues. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, they 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 still seem to yeah. For, given the squad they've got, they're doing pretty well. They they're doing pretty well. It's a shame they didn't get a losing bonus point, but they they were yeah. They're not they're not looking too bad. Um, uh, I'd like I'd like to see them without Aaron Smith for three weeks and see what they're like there. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. I think they've done a lot better than a lot of people gave them credit for, us especially as well. They will wrap that, that, wrap that game up then. As I say, the Highlanders have surprised a lot of, lot of people um, with what they've done. As I say, they've got some good, they're all blacks have stood up for them and they've got some young talent coming through. Um, Josh Mackay again was good on the wing for them. Um, yeah, as I say, just wasn't their day and the Blues were a lot better and they've gonna put, they're going to put pressure on the Hurricanes and the Crusaders. Um, to get the jobs done, really, as we go into the big game um, next week, which is, I believe, they're playing the... Uh, no, they're not. No, I'm one week ahead. They're not quite playing the Crusaders yet. Um, but, as I say, they put themselves in the... They need. They need to, They got what they needed to do out of the game. So, that's, that's good for them. I know they're in, a, they're in their bye week next week. That's my point. So, do you think that the Chiefs, one more game, Hurricanes next week... Are they going to lose all their games? They've got a win at the Hurricanes away. Mm, they're not going to. They're not going to beat the Hurricanes in 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 Wellington, unfortunately. The Hurricanes are on. They are 
the informed team in Super Rugby Aotearoa. They've, I think, the, the they've got a chance. So don't get me wrong. I think the with obviously losing Ben Lamb and a Kobish Van Vyke is obviously not around. Maybe not going to be u- utilised. Obviously, Arve is coming in, but they've lost Lau Mape, who's their massive weapon in the centre. So it might be a bit closer. So they've got a chance, but I think the Hurricanes are on a collision course to take that and they put themselves in the right position. So no, I think the Chiefs will remain winless. So nice. we're just we're, we're just waiting for Dan Carter moment last match. Last last round, come on, 79th minute, kick kick winning points against Crusaders. Is that is it, is that what we're going down to now? <laughs> Imagine if it happens. That would be ridiculous. I'd love to see him get on the pitch, but for whatever reason I don't think he's going to. I think he's just been in there as injury replacement. They haven't needed him. That's fine. They've he's managed to stay fit um, and stay in touch with rugby and managed to get a bit of coaching done. I don't think he's going to really be any more than that. Sadly, um, be great if he does though. It would be awesome to see him put him on. Yeah, it's kind of a weird situation because as a rugby purist, you'd love to see him, and I think all of New Zealand would like to see him out again because he's probably been the greatest fly half of all time, certainly in the professional era anyway. But I think for me. You've got a guy like Atira Black who's been moved to the bench the last two games to accommodate Bowden Barrett uh, and he's hungry and that he's got definitely got a very bright future ahead of him. So for me, um, I don't see him happening. It was quite interesting to see Ben Smith in the crowd at the Hurricane at the Highlanders game. He's coaching, I think he's coaching at Southland Boys at the moment. Yeah. Um, so he bless him. I'm really pleased that he's gonna get a contract in Japan and make loads of money and then retire. But I don't think he could. He looks like a guy that was just out with his kid, just a normal-looking bloke. He doesn't look, bless him. I think age is getting on. He's he's on the wrong side of thirty now. But he definitely could still cut it, and he will do well in Japan, especially with him and Aaron Cruden in the same team. That Kobe Steelers team was going to be ridiculous. Um, but yeah, uh, that's uh, yeah on that on that point. But as I say, that wraps up sort of our chat on Super Rugby RTRO. Let's pop across to Super Rugby AU. Uh, The Rebels, um, in the end, um, edged out the force for the last minute dramatic super super time try pushover by their um, returning All Black, not All Black, sorry, uh, returning Wallaby, uh, Issa Nisarani. Um, who was unfortunately yellow carded in the game, but didn't have the greatest start. But he came on back, obviously came back off the bench and carried exceptionally well. Um, Rebels looked look good. Reese Hodge had the opportunity to win it with a massive over 55 meters, and it just dropped short. And I think on a warmer day, it might it might go over. But he was brilliant for them at fullback. With Hayla Petty was injured. Um, they're looking a decent little outside bet. They're very similar to what I would say is the Hurricanes are in Super Rugby RT era. They're sort of in the outside lane. But um, yeah, on, on that, just one guy to sort of really pick up for me and sort of a discussion with is uh, Trevor H- uh, uh, Hazir, who's the 20 year old, six foot six, um, second row, who took a couple of line outs and stole a couple against the fourth. Um, with, um, with, 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 I, there was a thing in the um, on the different site that was talking about how the four Wallabies locks that were at the World Cup. So Rob Simmons and Adam Coleman are now both at London Irish. Woo, 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 woo. That's definitely a million pound salary second row. Um, and then obviously you've got Isaac Rodder, who's now signed at Lyon, and Rory Arnold, who's at Toulouse. So basically Dave Rennie's got to find a second row. And this guy, you need to put him in. Because he's basically the next Will Skelton. This guy is huge. Huge, yep. And he um, carries well. Really good carrier. He's got a really bright future ahead of him. Um, good line out. Um, Steelers as well. But yeah, Rebels looking good. Force, Brian Ralston's top try scorer, which is great for them. Um, guy that's sort of been playing around. That looked really well. They've got a really nice team try with Frim- Frisbee holding the ball up. Sold to Billy Meeks down the river. Lance hit the hole and Rolston finished it off. But again, <laughs> close enough for the force, but they're still not there to really challenge anyone. But they're playing well. Well, they were, they were, it was a draw at 80 mm. minutes. We saw yeah. our first super, I don't know what they call it, super over, <sighs> not equivalent. I don't know. Yeah, um, um, 
but to, to be fair, we did write them off completely at the start of the season, and they did they didn't look too bad. Um, uh, and the fact that they've just it's just some of the names you see in the, in their team sheet kind of kicking about um, uh, that are old used used to feature in the Premiership or places people like Kieran Longbottom and John O'Lance, who 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 looked looked good off the tee um, uh, and didn't didn't look too bad at all. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I think kind of it's good to see that they've 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 come back and and they can kind of compete. Um, uh, but it's as it's clear that it's not the standard that um, it is in New Zealand, but it's still quite entertaining rugby to watch. Yeah, they've got their own unique sort of style, and, and that's why I don't think this Trans Tasman competition they're talking about will work because it will just involve the New Zealand teams battering each other, and then they'll just go and smash the Australians, come back. I just don't see it working. I think they've got an opportunity there to sell their own product and. As I say, the, all the games are really exciting. Um, you've got the, I say, the Brumbies taking a 22 to 20 victory over the Reds with um, a last-minute um, kick from um, Hansen, Kenzie Hansen at the end. Absolutely brilliant scenes after they got two lovely drive-over tries. Falau Fang is just like the kid just pops up at the back and he just drives himself over. Um, definitely team tries, but um, yeah, the Reds look better. Harry Wilson's definitely worth a look at, um, the number eight for the Reds. He is, he's got a very bright future ahead of him. Some really big carries. He's got a nice try. Um, but as I say, it was a top of the table clash. It was always going to be close and the Brumbies nicked it. So that puts them right in the driving seat, um, really, um, for, to take Super Rugby AU. Um, any other points off those two games, lads? Or do you want to move on to your player of the week? Uh, player of the week... Nice stuff, right? That's a nice little transition. So our team of the week is up now on our Instagram. So go and have a look at that and engage in that. As I say, we really are trying to build our um, online profile and grow this podcast. So please do give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter as well. But predominantly, we're looking on that Instagram stuff. Do grow it as well. It really is appreciated as well. So our player, players of the week, um, we, what we do is we usually uh, pick one player um, and then we'll get you guys to vote on their Instagram about who you think the overall one is. But yeah. Johnny, what do you think? Christie, Finlay. Thought he was really good. Um, solid performance. I think the pressure was on probably to perform against Aaron Smith. Got two tries and and just linked up well with Bowden um, and just allowed Bowden to play. I think they kind of were very good at letting Bowden sit back off the ball, have the forwards and maybe they'd do a ball out the back and he kind of, he kind of let that let them settle into the game um, and he knows when to go for a break um, and he runs great support lines. He's always there kind of in the background running support lines. I just thought he had a very all-round kind of good game. Tricky? Um, yeah, I'm going to, sorry, Johnny, this is probably going to be your one. I'm going to go with the obvious one. Uh, I'm going to go with Caleb Clark. Um, just very impressed with him. Um yeah, just um, some of the breaks he made were just ridiculous. And I still can't get over that bosh from carrying the ball in midair. Oh, that was ridiculous. So, um, yeah, it's got to be Caleb Clark for me. The temptation for me is to sort of pop over to um, Super Rugby AU just to sort of get an Australian in there. As I say, I thought Harry Wilson was class of the Reds, a guy that I've not seen a lot of, but he was really good. And then, as I said, I've talked about Trevor um, Hazir as well, but... I'm going to make it a Blues triple threat. <laughs> and I'm going to go with Fisa Tunga Fassi because I thought he was absolutely phenomenal. Just, as I say, he just his work rate around the park for a big lad is ridiculous. He's got such good hands that he has that link play that kind of stands at first receiver a couple of times. He just pulls the ball back. Basically, what a really cool skill set that you need now as a prop is that ability to know when to pass, know when to carry. As I say, he put poor old Aiden Johnston, who's a good, solid, loose head, on toast on the rack permanently and got himself a try. So, yeah, sorry to bore everyone, but we're going with three three Blues players because I'd say I thought they all three of those were absolutely class. Um, but, yeah, shout out to those guys we mentioned at Super Rugby AU because, again, they were very good as well. Um, right then, let's finish off. Um, for those new to the podcast, what we are doing is we are finishing off with predicting our Lions starting team. 
for the first test against South Africa next year. So what we've got at the moment uh, is uh, Mako Vinopola, Jamie George and Carl Sinclair in the front row. The engine room of Mara Toji and Alwyn Jones and the slightly off track back row of Courtney Laws, Justin Tipperick and Billy Vinopola. Um, with Thomas Williams and Owen Farrell as 9 and 10. Uh, so we're going to look at the centre combination today. Um, and yeah, tricky. As, as the honorary centre in our podcast, would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, very excited about this, not just because it's my position, but there's just an awful lot of strength throughout the Four Nations. There's a lot of different combinations you can have, each offering something slightly different. So the biggest thing, I guess similar to the back row um, with this tour and with this selection is going to be the type of game that they want to play in and combating the South Africans because the South Africans play with a lot of um, size, they play with a lot of physicality. You're going to need quite a lot of physicality in that centre partnership to combat that, I think. And so that there's what brings a bit of a challenge, but something that could be quite exciting. So obviously the, the sort of names you're looking at are, obviously you've got Tuolangi. I think Tuolangi, if he's fit, has to be in there somewhere. His fitness has been the thing that's played him in years gone by, but he's been okay recently. So hopefully that's all good for him. So Tuolangi is in there, can obviously play if needed to, he can play 12 or 13. So that's a that's um, something that will work in his favour, I think. Um, and when you're thinking about different combinations, um, others that you throw in there, um, a few Irish lads, you've got Wimby Aki, um, Gary Ringrose, um, Jonathan Davis, depending on what he's doing. He's getting a little bit old now and has been struggling with injuries, but he's one of the best players to pull on a line shirt and has been awesome in the last few tours that he's been on. So he's another one named to throw in the mix there. It's a very good opportunity to, if they're both fit and on form, to test it because that would be a, an amazing partnership. But for me, another one that's quite interesting. That Sorry. I couldn't find... So going off. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're thinking about physicality and, and size in the centre, one thing that could be quite exciting and quite interesting is Bundayaki and Manu Tuolangi. How much sort of... Gatlin would probably like that. He probably would. That's the thing as well. He would go for that. And you'd find it very hard to get through that centre partnership. And that also gives you quite a lot of carrying options um, in the midfield as well and, and players that are going to hold defenders. That would be quite exciting. A little bit rogue, a little bit left field. I think that is something that they might do. Um, I think the thing, biggest thing for me is you've, where do you play Tuolangi? If Tuolangi's fit, you have to play him because he's so good. He's awesome. Uh, and then it's just who do you want to pair in with him depending on where you put him at 10, uh, 12 or 13. Go for a little curveball win. Nick, Nick Tompkins. Ooh. He's been, I mean, I know he's he's still at Saris. Um, I'm not sure if he's going on loan anywhere next year. He's going to um, he's going to the Dragons on loan for a year, I believe. So he's going on loan to the Dragons. He'll play for Wales. Um, and he's played with Farrell, which could be quite a significant thing, um, and could be a decent option at twelve. But he's not. But he's only. I don't know. He's he's probably not quite six foot. He's not the biggest of blokes, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see whether they go the approach of the Bundiaki to Alagi and kind of you're matching that South African power, especially. But then I think the problem is, is if you have someone like Turalagi at 13 with the outside backs that South Africa have, yes, he's great kind of carrying and he's great in defence, probably if people are trying to run directly at him, but. Has he got the pace? Would he be the ideal choice of kind of covering those outside backs and supporting his wingers um, and covering back if you have some like some of those South African wingers, um, uh, Chesley Colby and people, Turalagi? I mean, because he's getting on a bit. Would you would you would you want Turalagi at thirteen or have him at twelve? And then I don't know. Sounds awful because I'm picking another Englishman, but someone like Slade. Um, I, as I say, I think the tour language between is going around a lot, and I think uh, rightly so. He's a very, very exciting player. I think what you can kind of go two ways in it, and I think the the comp, some, combination I quite like to see. It's never ever going to happen though. But um, someone who we've not talked about yet, who's a very, who is a very, very good twelve, um, 
and just to sort of get a Scotland in there. I think you could potentially go with Scott uh, Johnson and Manu Tuolang in the centre wouldn't be outrageous if you wanted to hit brute force with brute force. I think Johnson does a little bit more than Bundy Aki can. Um, and he's certainly a lot younger and he's certainly a bit more robust, I think. But the combination, and you've mentioned Nick Tompkins a bit of a left field. I'm going to go even further left field into another field. And I'm going to suggest, I think Tua Lange for me at 12, because they liked, they liked having Teo at 12. And I think with, if we're going to really come up against Dialende, and it's probably going to be Am really, if South Africa are fit, We've got the, got the best guys out there. Um, Tuolangi versus Delande is good, but we want a bit of X Factor at 13. And who's that? Rory Hutchins. Hutchinson. Yeah. See, I, I would go for Ring Rose. Yeah, as would I. Ring Rose is quality. Yeah. If you want a bit of X Factor and a bit of pace and agility, but Hutchinson. Ring Rose is mm. I think I would say Hutchinson is my left field. Go on, get him, on, get him in and get him on the plane. I think, as I said, the experience factor. But for me, I, and hope prop maybe the centre combination we want to be going down with is to Alangi and Ringrose. Because as I say, Ringrose is pretty much like Rory Hutchinson, but with a bit more, I'd say, tie-level international experience. Um, but they're very similar players. I would, I would want to go with a balance of having a big 12. So to Alangi, Johnson, Bundiaki, Davis. You could shift Davis in one. Because, again, you talk about pace. If you're going up against Cheslin Colby and the like, Jonathan Davis is a fantastic centre, but he's not, gonna, he's not getting back and taking um, uh, Colby anytime soon. So, I would say propose to Alangi and Hutchinson. Uh, not Hutchinson, sorry. I propose to Alangi and uh, Gary Ringrose. That's why I would go with. I'd probably, I'd probably go with that. I think the other question on the Lions I'm thinking about is... Or the South Africa, sorry, is their centred partnership. They'll probably have the Elende, but who the other person is. Because thinking about it, is the rugby championship agreed for this year yet? There's a chance South Africa, South Africa's last test will be the World Cup and their next test will be the Lions. They might not play another game between now and so they're not unlikely to play, I don't know. They might not play another game until the Lions. Could that, well, it could, in the case, that could be. It depends. Um, is South Africa coming up? No, they're not. No, it's not. It's Japan and um, Fiji. Japan and um, Fiji that are coming up to play, which is quite nice. I think that would be a unique competition. Um, yeah, you might be right. I mean, whether South Africa pop over to sail and take. Um, uh, Johan van Rensburg as the absolute meaty, the beef. Um, but they've got they've got plenty of, plenty of options in there. But as I say, yeah, Might, could be interesting. So it's certainly something to watch with how that's all going to sort of link together anyway. Um, but yeah, let's sort of wrap it up there then. So we've got our lines centre combination, just the back three to do next week, and then we'll move on to the next round of our 15s feature. So. Uh, just to recap for everyone, we've got Mako, George, Sinclair, Marrow, Alan Jones, Courtney Laws, Justin Tipperick, Billy Benapola, Thomas Williams, Owen Farrell, um, Manu Tuangi at 12, and Gary Ringrose at 13. Um, bumper pat stuff for you next week. Coming next week is we will, um, uh, on Sunday's pod, we'll preview, sorry, review um, next week's games of the Hurricanes and the Chiefs but, and the Crusaders versus the Highlanders. Uh, and then in Super Rugby AU, it's the Rebels versus the Brumbies and the Waratahs versus the Reds. But we'll also be doing a um, little discussion about the restart of the Premiership as we'll be a week away um, from that. Um, and what we're going to be doing is this week is we're going to be posting um, 15s of play of what we think maybe the, the 15s of the Premiership teams might be looking as their return. And obviously, they've got some big signings that have come in there. So we're going to talk about each team and... I like some uh, key players to what you can watch out for as the Premiership returns uh, on August um, the 15th, 14th, I think it is, at the top, off the top of my head. But as I say, um, as I say, thanks for in uh, engaging with the pod. Where I say we're on e Acast from YouTube. Go follow us on um, Instagram and Twitter as well. We really do appreciate helping us grow this platform, this content. 
And yeah, we'll see you on Friday for our preview pod. And then again on Sunday for that bumper review of um, Super Rugby, RTRO and AU. And then we're going to prep the Premiership. See you later, lads. See you, lads.